Chapter 7. The Ring of Fire. The date was April 11, 1985. My wife Julie, and myself, were traveling down Boulder Highway, returning from a visit to Hoover Dam. The divided roadway was fairly busy that early afternoon, when suddenly it happened. Watch out! Screamed my wife, as the car seemed to appear from nowhere. I quickly hit the brakes, swerved to avoid the blue car and was struck from behind by the automobile directly in back of us. This sent us racing into the dirt median area, where we spun several times before finally coming to a complete stop. The dust had been so thick that we could not see out the windshield, while spinning like a top. The impact had been so great that Julie's sunglasses were now resting in the back seat of the car, and I could not move. She quickly unhooked her seatbelt and rushed to my side. I still could not move. She took off my seatbelt, but all I could do was just lay there with my head against the headrest, and my hands on the steering wheel. Continuously she assured me that I was not alone, that I would be all right. Soon, the ambulance arrived, and after refusing any aid, Julie insisted that they treat me first. She watched in horror as they literally pulled me by the belt of my pants onto a backboard, and taped my head down. She was allowed to ride in the front of the ambulance only, and all she could do was to watch from her vantage point as they poked my legs and feet with a sharp instrument, and asked me if I could feel it. Unfortunately, the feeling had not returned to my body from the neck down. After arriving at the hospital, I was whisked away behind a locked door to the treatment area. For nearly two hours, they examined me, and all the while Julie sat in the waiting area, unable to see me or know anything that was going on in my treatment room. Shortly, the highway patrol officer came through the door to take her report. What about the blue car? He asked. Oh, you mean the one that was stopped? She replied. Well, I guess that's all for now, he said closing his notebook. You see, she had seen the car in front of us appear to be stopped and had also seen several people around the outside of the car. She assumed that they had a flat tire and were fixing it. Only later did she realize that no one would be fixing a flat in the middle of the fast traffic lane when there was a huge median area. The officer had apparently thought that she was in shock, because of her answer to his request for information regarding the blue car, and abruptly ended his questioning, after only two or three questions. An eyewitness report to the highway patrol officers had later confirmed, by a personal call to the party by us, stated that the blue car, called a phantom car by the highway patrol, had preceded us into the dirt median area, and as soon as we came to a stop, it proceeded to dart out of the area, head down the highway and disappear from sight. Keep in mind that this is a long, straight stretch of road, and the distance you could see up ahead was quite far. The young man told us that he himself couldn't understand why that blue car had gone into the dirt area before us, and had darted out as soon as we stopped. But we knew. Once again, the men in black had tried to put us out of commission. And once again they had failed. My wife was totally distraught by the time they finally let her in to see me. This was approximately five hours after our arrival at the hospital. All that time, she sat alone, in a strange hospital, behind a locked door, surrounded by strangers who knew nothing of either one of us. All she could think about was that her husband might be dying, and no one was even back there in the treatment room praying for him. I'm sorry I wrecked the car, I said as she approached the bed where I lay awaiting my ride to the x-ray department. Who cares? She replied as she walked to my side and gently kissed my lips. The highway patrol officer was still standing there and tried to caution her about touching me, but she would not be stopped. Tears filled her eyes as she saw me helpless, flat on my back. They allowed her to stay only a few moments before they took me upstairs for further tests. I kissed her again and back she went to the waiting area not knowing when she would see me again and what my condition would be. As we approached the radiology department, I saw a familiar figure. After asking the technicians to leave the room in his inimitable fashion, Vi approached the head of my bed and placed his hands on either side of my head. Frank, don't worry. Do not say anything. Everything will be all right, he said. His words sounded like the song of angels and I closed my eyes while I heard him pray that God would perform another healing miracle for one of his children. As quickly as he had appeared, he was gone. I felt a warm, 
tingly sensation throughout my entire body. The technicians returned and x-rayed me from head to toe. It would be several hours before I would return to the emergency treatment area. By that time the miracle had been fulfilled and I was allowed to get up and get dressed. I could see the grave disappointment on the face of the attending physician. I had overheard him earlier discussing the financial aspects of my case. Suffice it to say that the dollar signs had left his eyes and he shook his head in utter dismay. A few minutes later, Julie would finally be allowed to see me again and together we walked out to the front desk to check out. As we passed an open door, inside we could see the same ambulance drivers who brought us in. They had apparently brought in another person. When they saw me upright, walking out, they both did a double take and one said, you mean your neck's not broken? You mean your hip's not broken? Said the other in amazement. They could not believe their eyes seeing me walk out of that hospital so soon under my own steam, arm in arm with my wife. She had actually refused treatment to make sure that the paramedics and the doctors at the hospital attended me first. This would not be a decision she would ever make again because accepting treatment for herself would have at least gotten her in back of the locked door and in the same area where I was. We smiled at the two who had been so kind to us and assured them that I was indeed all right now. They continued to shake their heads still not believing what they were seeing with their eyes. We called a taxi to return us to our hotel. The car had not been drivable and had been towed to the car dealer for repair. That night I was able to go aboard Victor 1 for further treatments and a more complete explanation of what had taken place. Please keep in mind that shortly before this incident took place, Julie and I had celebrated our marriage and we were in the area on our honeymoon. We had been there only two days when this incident took place. By the time the next morning came, she was in quite a bit of pain from her own injuries and still very shaken by the entire incident. It would be three days later, in the middle of the night, that I would awaken to hear her crying at the thought that someone actually wanted us permanently removed from this life. She had been hearing stories of the men in black for many years but this was the first time she had personal knowledge. Unfortunately, it would not be her last. Because of the impact of this incident on our lives, I was informed by Commander Vi that the time was now right for certain knowledge to be given to me to share with others. This information is the ring of fire prayer and ceremony which Vi told me that he and his people perform before they ever set foot on this planet. I will inform you now of a segment of divine order that was established before the very foundation of this planet was laid. The words which you are about to read are absolute in all respects. The mysterious pang of fire will become a vital part of your life. It is an essential part of one's walk on the path to true light and provides you with a cloak of protection never before made available. Almighty God has made provision to change our hearts and minds. It is up to each of us to adopt these changes in our lives. Since the war in heaven, Lucifer and his band of angels, a full one-third of the heavenly host, were cast down into the planet Earth. Holy writings, throughout the ages, have testified that this planet has been held captive by him and that he is in fact the prince of the powers of the air. It is under his influence that the atmosphere which you now breathe has become polluted with health-threatening particles. Every evil that is committed on earth today can be traced to the influence of Lucifer and his crew. The level of crime, the disharmony, the disunity, man's inhumanity to man, all these under his evil influence. Because of this, those from other planets are instructed to perform a ceremony called the Ring of Fire. Although performed by a few in Bible days, the threats of the early church kept this information hidden from the people until very few now know of its power. There is a formula by which all of you can benefit from the divine protection which results from this ceremony. Some of you may even take issue with the manner in which this power is invoked. But that is immaterial. The name in which the invocation is pronounced may cause friction. But I will inform you of this great truth without reservation. The proof is in the pudding, so to speak. The formula has withstood the test of time. If our friends from space invoke this divine protection before ever setting foot on this planet, can we be so complacent as to not afford ourselves the same opportunity? Will you allow the evil forces to continue their deeds of destruction to every phase of life on earth until there is nothing left? Or will you maintain an open mind and accept the freedom and protection that is offered to you here? Fire has always been representative of divine protection, cleansing and purification. Far too many people are dying before their time while others are suffering unnecessary sickness and disease. 
UFO researchers are increasingly becoming targets of the ungodly forces which permeate our world. Even the governments are deceiving the people into believing lies. In view of these facts, do you or do you not, need to be surrounded by the ring of fire? Please follow these instructions carefully. 1. Place a lighted white candle before you on a table or other flat surface. Be careful to place a dish or other object under the candle to catch any drips. 2. Under no circumstances should you permit anyone or anything to interrupt you while you are performing this ceremony. 3. Recite the Lord's Prayer. 4. Pray the following prayer without doubt in your heart. Believe that the God of creation is hearing you at the very moment that you are praying. Keep your eyes open as you pray, lifting your outstretched hands heavenward. Look into the flame and maintain your full senses. Know what you are doing at all times. Repeat aloud. Eternal Father, Creator of the Universe. Hear this day my petition. Surround me now, with your divine ring of fire. The fire of your protection, the fire of your abundance, the fire of complete healing, the fire of divine abundance. I now command the hand of Almighty God on my behalf, let it be so, this very moment, in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, as you look into the flame of the candle, place all your heartfelt desires as well as your problems, into the flame. Extinguish the candle and watch the smoke rising as to the nostrils of God as He receives your prayers. Do not remove yourself from the room for at least three full minutes. As you stand before the extinguished candle, keep your eyes open and feel the presence of the ring of fire. You can perform this prayer slash ceremony anywhere, anytime. Even while driving your car, you can pronounce the words and feel the protection of the ring of fire. You will never be the same again.